Who the revelation start with? God. Oh, there we go. God the Father, and then who did he go to? John. John. To Jesus, about Jesus, and then who did he go to? John. We know John's coming in there. <laughs> to an angel. Actually, you went to an angel. <laughs> if we got to keep, keep going, Dad. You're going to go one more to God. John the Revelator. Oh, there's John. <laughs> there's John. <laughs> then to the seven churches in Asia and ultimately to us. So that's it. We've looked at that. And uh, we looked at uh, two weeks ago, not last week, because last week was Father's Day, but two weeks ago we looked at the message to uh, Ephesus. Who remembers the message to Ephesus, the gist of it? He lost your first love. There you go. He said, this church is orthodox, hardworking, discerning, but they left the first love. Mm -hmm. Now when you think about that, that's not a very good commendation. I don't think I would want the Lord to look at us and say, hey, you are orthodox, you're holy, you're righteous. One thing is you just don't love everybody. You don't love me and you don't love people. I don't think that would be a good commendation. So uh, he told them, repent, remember, and return. <laughs> well, today, because we only got two more weeks, I looked at these messages. And I'd like us to look at the message to Laodicea which is the last church, and then next week we're going to uh, look at Philadelphia. But today is Laodicea. So, you got your Bible there, uh, you can turn to Revelation 3, 14. But let me tell you a little bit about Laodicea, what I found out from reading some sources. Laodicea was located on one of the main roads of, of Asia and became a thriving metropolis of Asia. You can see here on the map, here was Ephesus, and here was Laodicea, and apparently there were roads that would lead into Asia further, and uh, it would go right by Laodicea. And when the Romans took over, that became a just a catalyst for it to become just a major, major uh, thriving city. It was a great banking and financial center, and one of, it was one of the wealthiest cities in the world at that time. In AD 61, it was devastated by an earthquake, but it was so rich and independent that it refused help from the Roman government and used its own resources to rebuild the city. And that's a rich city. It was a great clothing center, and the sheep which were raised there were famous for its soft, violet black, glossy wool. It was a medical center and had a famous medical school and some of its doctor's names appeared on the coins of Laodicea. The medical center was well known for its ear ointment and its eye ointment. William Barclay, the historian, says, such then was Laodicea, the city which was too prosperously wealthy to have any real need of God. I think we, we have an idea of that city was a thriving city, perhaps something like the city in the Bay Area. Thriving medical centers, commerce, but perhaps in real need of God. So let's look at the first uh, uh, verse of this introductory statement that the Lord gives to this church. Remember, he's the one, and that first chapter that is shown as the one with those, those penetrating eyes uh, that could see, it seems just right through. You could see all of the motives, all of the, uh, the, the reasons why we do things or don't do things, and was able to just discern that church and understand it fully. And uh, we can see him. And he says to the angel, the pastor of the church in Laodicea, right, from the amen. What's amen mean? So be it. It's certain. It's true. And as the dean of my school used to say, saying amen to a preacher is like saying sickum to a dog. <laughs> <laughs> that was Dr. Feinberg. That's what he said. So this description at each of the seven churches at the beginning, he takes one aspect of Christ, and this one is he's the amen. He's the faithful and the true witness. He can be the relied upon. Uh, sometimes witnesses, you can't depend upon them. 
especially these ones, if you watch these uh, murder mysteries like that, Gailey and I watch, where they, they go into the courtroom, not the CSI stuff, but I'm talking about the real murder stories. And it's always suspect when they bring in somebody from prison to say what somebody, another prisoner told them while they're in there. And of course you understand, you know, if he testifies, he gets a break and he gets relief. There's something about, suspect about that. Like, how could you really trust this prisoner? Well, Jesus is the faithful and the true witness. He's not going to be swayed in any way inappropriately. He's the beginning of creation. Amen? Statement. He's the faithful witness. And then here, the creation, beginning of creation, means that Jesus has rank authority. I love this passage in Colossians. And I think of this, I think it's so helpful for us to understand what it means by Jesus being the beginning of creation. For by him all things were created, talking about Jesus, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now that's a creator. Not only is everything created through him, but he holds it together. Gailey and I were looking last night at the moon. How many looked at the moon? Wasn't that the brightest moon you've ever seen? Uh, they said that that would, uh, that was, it was either 30% bigger or 30% uh, brighter. Maybe it was both, but that, that had to be the brightest moon that I have ever seen in my life. And at four o'clock, uh, Gailey and I have our internal alarm systems and we were up at four o'clock. Couldn't see it. Anybody else check about three or four? What any moon out there? Huh? Our internal alarm clocks are all But there wasn't any moon out there. Clouds had covered it up. Everything it says here, he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's Jesus Christ. He's the beginning of creation. He's over creation. He's not a created being. He is just first in authority over it. Okay, so let's look. In each of these seven stories, uh, seven lessons to the seven churches, uh, Jesus uses, as he begins, very good psychology, and he begins with the commendation, the good things about the church. Uh, Ephesus, for instance. You're orthodox, you know, you're hardworking. No, it starts out with something good, which is a good approach to use. I think we would all agree. So what does he say good about this church? You that have your Bible there. What does he say good about it? Well, that's, that's good about Jesus, but that's not a church. So. Yeah, that's good about Jesus. That's not a church. Yeah, but what did, what did they say? What did he say good about it, though? That's a trick question. He didn't say anything good about this church. That's a trick question. That's to get you think. He didn't say anything about, good about this church. That's not a good start. If Jesus is talking to you, it's not a good start for him to not say anything good about it. You know. Uh, that is the distinctive thing about the church of Laodicea. There's no commendation. So this was, you know, it's going to be uh, a difficult saying that Jesus gives. So there's nothing about that. And uh, the others there were. But here he jumps right into this statement here in verse 15. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I don't think I would like Jesus to say that. I mean, if Jesus were to be, to come down physically right now and stand in front of us right here, would you appreciate him saying that to you? I don't think I'd, you know, any church would. That's a very strong statement of Jesus. Uh, I have, I have the, the world's best Weight Watcher instructor, seems to tell me. Uh, she has got her work cut out to slim me down, I'll tell you. 
And it's uh, completely her fault that I don't weigh less. I probably made that clear to her. She is just not good enough. She, she may be the best, but it's her fault. She's just not good enough. But uh, she, uh, she was telling uh, a story about how she loves key lime pie, the type that she makes. And it takes a special crust, special ingredients, and then she puts a meringue top on it. And she told about how she had made this pie. They were going to go up to Sacramento with some family. And she had made it. And uh, so at 4 o'clock in the morning, so they could get up to Sacramento in time and would have time to cool and everything, she is putting on the meringue. And she said, I torched the meringue twice to the point that the smoke alarm went off. <laughs> and my husband gets up and said, what are you doing? He said, I put on another coat of meringue, torched it again. But, she said, I finally got it done. We went up to Sacramento, and she said, somehow, it didn't get put in the refrigerator. <laughs> somehow, and she said it was 98 oh. degrees. And by the time it came time to eat it, her son, who loves this pie, cut into it, and she said it was just yucky, kind of a pudding type. She said it was just lukewarm. That's the picture. That's the picture. I would that you were hot or cold. Because you're lukewarm, I'm just going to, King James, spew you out of my mouth. Ooh, what a statement that he gives us there. The Apostle Paul, I think of him. Look at this thing back through the life of the Apostle Paul. Was there a time when he was cold? Yeah. Very cold? Frigid cold? Ice cold, cold hearted. He was cold. Was there a time when he was hot? Yeah. Zealous? Real hot? Was that guy ever lukewarm? I don't think, you know, you know, he's ever gonna to have to worry about being spewed out of Christ's mouth because he was cold and then he was hot, but lukewarm? Never. Lukewarm. What do you think when you think of a lukewarm Christian? What's a lukewarm Christian? Sunday they Sunday goer, does he go to church on Sunday? And remember, this was written to the church. <laughs> so these were people, these were church people. These wasn't, this wasn't written to those pagans outside of the church. This was church people that he said the lukewarm. They come to church on Sunday. What else would you think of when you think of a lukewarm Christian? How about a hypocrite? Well, give us another word. Give us something. What's uh, explained to us here? Give us some more. Well, thinking one way at one time and thinking another way another time. Just the opposite from one another. Okay. Possibly. Possibly. I think a little more. I think I'm, a, I'm, I'm really kind of put the lukewarm a little different category. Complacent. And what was the word? Complacent. Complacent, yeah. Okay. We're talking one way. I'd, get, I'd kind of put that, you know, the, I'd put that more as a hypocrite. Uh, I'm thinking, okay, go ahead. Non-committed? Yeah, I would say, he'd, he'd come to church on Sundays, you know, if, if there's... But in his heart. If it's not, you know, something else that's better doesn't come up. If the football, if the baseball game is on, I don't know if I'll make it. And he'll for his team to win. Uh -huh. He'll pray for his team to win. He'll pray for his team to win. All right, that's good. What else? Think of this guy. He's lukewarm. I don't really put this. The lukewarm is a is a hypocrite. He just sort of he just kind of goes with the flow. I mean, that's my picture of the lukewarm person. Pastor says, "Well, Amen, Pastor." You know, on the you know outside they say we ought to do something. The opposite. Amen. We ought to do that. You know, I mean, this I, that's kind of my feeling here. Well, let, let me give you a picture. Uh, here's here's. Uh, Here's John Wahlberg. Uh, he's what, this is what he says. Lukewarmness is what characterized the church in Laodicea. This state refers to those who have, been, who have manifested some interest in the things of God. They may be professing Christians who attend church but have fallen far short of a true testimony for Christ and whose attitude and actions raise questions concerning the reality of their spiritual life. They have been touched by the gospel 
but it is not clear whether they really belong to Christ. Lukewarmness is okay if you move him from cold and hot. You don't have to be like the Apostle Paul. In fact, most of us aren't like the Apostle Paul. Most of us go from cold to I don't even, who cares about Christ, who cares about the church, to a time when you think about it, you contemplate it, and we might say that then you're kind of warm up to it. Actually, if you're kind of warm this way, I think you're okay. It's just after you've been around for a while and you still, you know, you're learning the same things, uh, like the old story of the person who had 25 years of spiritual growth, and then the person who had 25 years of learning the same things he learned in year one. It's just a difference there. The tea kettle illustration. My wife and I, what we do when we're, when we're awake enough to see anything, we navigate towards the stove with the tea kettle. Because the first one up always turns the tea kettle on so you can have hot water. I navigated towards the stove this week and picked up the tea kettle and filled up my cup. And she said, hey, I just turned that water on. And I said, oh, no. So I sure enough, it was lukewarm. <laughs> what did I do with that? Threw it out. Uh, that's it, you know. That's, that's the lukewarm. You know, you don't want to be lukewarm in that way. Here's Francis Chan, noted pastor and speaker. Here's what he says. The core problem isn't the fact that we're lukewarm, half-hearted, or stagnant Christians. The crux of it all is, why are we this way? And it is because we have an inaccurate view of God. We see him as a benevolent being who is satisfied when people manage to fit him into their, lot, into their lives in some small way. We forget that God never had an identity crisis. He knows that he's great and deserves to be the center of our lives. What do you think of that statement? Yeah. <coughs> what do you think? What do you like about it? Direct. Direct? Doesn't depend on us. True. We lost the awesomeness of God. If you lose sight of the awesomeness of God, lukewarm sounds pretty good. And so the Israelites were told all throughout the Old Testament, the love of the Lord of God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Mm -hmm. I like this statement. He knows that he's great and deserves to be the center of our lives. Remember one time Chuck Swindoll had an illustration on the radio that a lot of people, probably the lukewarm Christian, uh, would like about three pounds of God. Enough to put into a paper bag and put on their mantle. Uh, just enough God. No, I don't want too much. About three pounds worth of God would be good. Rather, the lukewarm Christian is that, or I wish to say that maybe is descriptive of that. The world needs Christians, this is Francis Chan. <coughs> needs Christians who don't tolerate the complacency of their own lives. Anybody here ever get complacent in their Christian life? Three of us. Four of us. Five of us. We got five. I see that in it. <laughs> I like this thing. Francis Chan. <clears throat> the world needs Christians who don't tolerate the complacency of their own lives. You know, we, we realize that if we're complacent in the Christian life, that, that should upset us, right? We should not be satisfied if we're just going to be lukewarm, complacent, and, you know, oh well. You know, kinda, that, I think that would be a good uh, phrase, if be lukewarm. Oh well. Oh well. You know, instead of being involved in things there. All right, here's, uh, here's another one here. <clears throat> Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Think about that. Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but, at, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Bob, that brings me to the book of Ecclesiastes which I, it's one of my favorite books, that things don't matter. And you specifically say in the scriptures, what doesn't matter? That keeps me in my place. 
kick your butt down. <coughs> Yeah, and we, can't we succeed at it, but does it really matter? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the old, the navigators have their statement in their discipleship book. Uh, uh, something, in fact, things in life seem to come this way, uh, seems to come to us this way. Urgent. I've got to get this done. This is urgent. I've got to do it. I don't have time to read the Bible today because I've got to get to work. Or I've got to do this and I've got to whatever. But then, let's see if we have any good navigators here. What's the proper question we should ask ourselves? Somebody said it earlier. Is it important? We're filled in our lives with urgent matters. The question is, is are they important? And we can have the urgent to just drown out the important. And when that happens, I think we have to ask ourselves, am I becoming, am I really who we want? I think sometimes we strive to be successful in things that don't really matter, whatever. And sometimes we have a poor um, self-image. We don't know how valuable we are to God, so we succeed at this, at this, at this. So we can grab onto something. Well, at least I'm good at something. Okay, you know, that's good. Being a child of God, you know. I think that's good. Where we have to discover. I think a lot of it has to do with, with attitude. You know, this was like at the class we took with Brother Warren, that whatever it is you're doing, do it wholeheartedly with all your heart, you know, put your full effort into it. Whether it's making money or whatever it is, you're doing it for God. So a lot of it comes back down to attitude. Mm -hmm. Making money and being successful is not a bad thing. How you deal with it, Absolutely. That's right. In fact, does it really come down to priorities? Imagine our life. It's I think priority. there's a time that we need to periodically reprioritize. Exactly. And I think that's just as human beings, that's we that's what we need to do as, as people. We need to come back to those times and say, hey, am I really, you know, where am I going on this? All right, here's Christ's warning to Laodicea. <coughs> I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. He didn't say he spit in the mouth. He says, I'm about. It's interesting. I looked that up in the Greek, and it is a particular verb that is translated, I am about. Uh, most of the versions don't uh, put that in, but the NIV does. I'm about. So he's given them a warning here, as he often does. I, I'm spit you out yet, but I'm just telling you, I'm about to. So last warning, so to speak, it seems like that's what he's saying. Remember the parable of the tares and the wheat. <clears throat> what was what was sown? Seed. Seed. What came up? Seeds. All right. Seeds. But what was the second? What was the second thing sown? Tears. Tears. And when they both came up, then what did the master say? Leave them both. Let them both come up, and then what's going to happen? When the harvest comes, what's going to be taken first? The tares. I, the reason I know that, I just read it this morning again. Otherwise, I'd have to go back. The tares were first, and then what would happen to them? They were bundled up, ready to be burned, and then the wheat was taken up. And this is what he said after that parable. The Son of Man will send forth his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So the fact that we have, you know, lukewarm Christians in our midst shouldn't surprise us. Because Jesus said, let them both grow up. The day of judgment is going to come. But it ought to scare the bejeebers out of each of us enough to look into our lives and say, hey, am I, have I become lukewarm? 
You know, I just, you know, are my priorities what they should be? Christ okay. treatment. Go ahead, Judy. How about you saying that lukewarm Christians are going to be Christians? If they're going to be. Yeah, if they're going to be spewed out, it doesn't sound like that they really made it, does it? Maybe. It doesn't maybe sound like it. Maybe, yeah. Because no, no we know in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. But that is a scary thing. That there could be so many, quote, decisions, but not real followers and not real disciples. It, you know, I think we all should ask ourselves, am I, am I really in it? I think I've shared this with you when I went up to Hume Lake every summer as a kid, junior high through high school. I got saved every year. <laughs> Why take a chance? That's, I got saved a lot of other times after that. I, you know, I grew up in the air up in the church, if it was a good church, had a Billy Graham type of uh, altar call. You know, and if you didn't walk down, you at least prayed that sinner's prayer, just to be sure. You know, did I get the words right? You know, you know. Anybody else do that? I don't know what that whack on. Uh, <laughs> but why take a chance, you know? Well, All right, yes. I also think we need to be careful not to confuse someone who's maybe at a point where they're tired of being down yeah. or being lukewarm. They may be going through a phase. Yes. Of course. No, I'm serious because sometimes yeah. we feel right. tired and being down, don't want to be involved yeah. for a, a season. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, we all know that. Yeah. We all know that. that we hope go through phases in our life when we just need to be rest. I remember reading one story about a pastor and his wife whose son was given in his fits. And they, they went, I think he, he resigned as pastor. And they said they had, didn't go to church for months. And they just, uh, you know, had prayer and, and just spent time away from it. I mean, the church had just beat them down. And uh, they needed that. So, of course, there's times for rest on that. Uh, that's for sure. And a blind God brought them. Did you rest and you yeah. eat? You know? Obviously. Yeah, we need that. No question about it. Here's a treatment. Because you say, I am rich, and they, be, and they become wealthy. Now remember, what kind of city was this? So keep this in mind. Keep this in mind when, when we read this statement. I am rich, you say, Jesus says that I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Now this is the clothing center, the medical center, and Jesus said, no, you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. <laughs> Whoa! But we, but we have the, you know, the best medicine around. You know, we have Kaiser Permanente. Come on, give me a break here. You know, we, oh, we, we love Kaiser. Oh, yeah, amen. Keep, keep, oh Lord, keep them going. Keep them going. Keep them going. Keep them going. <laughs> I advise you, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. You think you're rich? And white garments, so that you may be, you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I saw to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Now that's quite a statement to a city known for its medical prowess. If you really want to be rich, buy it from me. And we read in First Peter about this this uh, fact that faith is compared to gold there. Uh, Peter talks about faith being more precious than gold. He said, I'm going to give you what's really rich. Not what is just convenient, but rather what's rich there. All right, so we think of that. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. So he loves them. He wants to reprove them, discipline them, be zealous. And repent. In other words, change your ways there. He extends this to the Laodiceans as well. Love this verse, don't we all? Behold, I stand, say it, read it with me, at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Isn't that one of our favorite verses? And that's, that's been, you know, in Christian literature for decades. When I first became a Christian, you know, they said, this is a good verse to tell people that Christ is knocking at the door of your heart. And it all sounds pretty good. 
This picture has become very famous over the years about Christ knocking at the door. What's unique about that door? It doesn't have a doorknob. Isn't that something? There's no doorknob there. You know, unless you look for it, you think, well, my golly, there isn't a doorknob there. It will not force its way in there. It won't force its way in there. Christ is a gentleman and will not force his way into our lives. Notice, there is no door handle. Good, good Bible teacher there. It's up to us to open the door of our heart. We can let him in or keep him out. Will he always be knocking at our heart's door? That's the question, isn't it? Will he always be knocking? Well, we know that sometimes there's going to come eventually where it's over. That it's coming. Find a picture there. Well, yeah. Since uh, this scripture is writing to Christians, why is this verse, I mean, this verse is talking to, is to Christians. Right. So they said it already. Right. That's always a good question in the back of my head. If you remember, uh, who was our uh, assistant principal at school, Mark, who was the preacher, O'Neill? Dr. O'Neill had a thing about this verse. He was a teacher of preaching. He'd say, you know, that verse is to Christians. Because we use it as evangelism, but that's really written to the Christians. You know, he, I, I, mean, I don't know how many times he'd go rail on that. And, okay, I hear it. So you, you, you didn't know it, but you're, you're saying the same thing. It is written to Christians. So why is he saying that? Well, let's go further, and I think we'll, this will help us uh, figure it out here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him. And he with me. Now, how many this morning, before you, you came to church, dined? How many of you dined at home? Did you dine? Did you dine? Yes. You dined. You dined? I didn't die. It was a quick breakfast. He quit. You didn't die then. A dying. Dying. <laughs> we didn't die. Gaining wasn't even up. How can we die when Gaining's not even up? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I get up in the morning, <laughs> cook my own <laughs> breakfast, <laughs> crying out loud. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, I'll, just, I'll just tell you just between us chickens here, you know. Remember what happens in the cafe? Stays in the cafe. <laughs> Used, in the olden days, when I would preach on Sunday morning, Andy would get up and fix me a great breakfast, and I would dine before I preached. She does not consider this a high enough level. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't dine Sunday morning. I get up. You will next Sunday. I, I get up. I get up and do whatever I, I can. You dine here at the fellowship house. <laughs> <laughs> we dine here at the fellowship All right, William Barclay, great great commentaries on the historical aspects of the scriptures. He is good. And he's done the research and he tells us of three different words that refer to meetings. The Greek word akratisma was the Greek word for breakfast. And that was typically a dry bread dipped in wine. Now, I don't eat Greek, because if I had dry bread dipped in wine, I would be gone the whole day. I don't eat Greek. I don't eat Greek that way. Greek yogurt? Well, maybe that's you know, something else. Do you have a verse for that quote there? <laughs> here's, here's another Greek word. Midday meal. The Greek word for that is ariston. This is where the man did not go home from work but he ate his picnic-style lunch away from home, perhaps in the field. That was the Greek word ariston. Neither one of these is the one that's used here and translated dine. Evening meal, date not, which was the main meal of the day where people ate together, lingered long, and leisurely talked over the day's events. That's the word that's used. Dining. Fine dining, cuisine. That's where you go and you have those fancy napkins, you know, those cloth napkins. That's where you have, you know, about, about 14 different forks and knives. 
and the spoon, you know. That's where it might take you, you know, the Cornelian room, I hear is pretty good up in San Francisco if you like French food, and Tony is not into that, Cornelian room. That's where you go and spend about two or three hours dining, talking about the events of your life, sharing your life. That's the word you do. That's, that's the idea. So Jesus is telling us right here, if you not, if you stand at the door and knock and, and arrange your priorities, I'll come and dine with you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. What's the cure for lukewarmness? Spending unhurried time with Christ. How do you get over lukewarmness? For that matter, how do you get over everything in the Christian life? How do you get over hurt? How do you get over whatever? You have to spend unhurried time with Christ. I was going to say, turn the heat up on the stove when it's hot. <laughs> okay. Here's a man named Morgan. All I know about is a guy named Morgan. But I like his statement. The only cue for lukewarmness is the readmission of the excluded Christ. Apostasy must be confronted with his fidelity. Looseness with, with conviction born of his authority. Poverty with the fact of his wealth. Frost with the mighty fire of his enthusiasm. There is no other cure for the lukewarmness of the church than the readmitted Christ. Now that's a statement. But how do we get over our lukewarm? Well, we realize I'm lukewarm, or at least, you know, I can be described that way. We have to spend unhurried time with Christ. There he is. Knocking at the door of our heart, not as we normally think of it, like you want to accept Christ, but hey, am I really dining with Christ? Am I just taking the time to be with him? Am I going to carve out time in my day? I am going to spend time with my Bible and prayer and God. Instead of just being so hurried with all these urgent things, we forget the important. Bob, when we look in the, the South, the South Texas, seem like probably at least once and sometimes twice a year the church would have an all-out revival. Mm -hmm. And it would be like two or three days of just solid church-going, prayer, singing, revival stuff, wow. fellowship at church. And I don't think we've ever done that out here. I think we probably should. Yeah. I, yeah. He, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. Well, think about this. He, at the end of each of these seven messages to the churches, he gives them a word of encouragement and overcomer. You can be able to sit with me on my throne. Whoa! Think about that. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, we're going to be sitting with Christ and ruling with Christ. When this is over and done, we're going to be with him. Ruling. Can you beat that? Now that's that's the type of uh, person you want to you know sit down with. So if we keep our relationship with him, we're going to be okay. What a promise he gives. The last question: Are you ready to spend time with him? That's the question. Are you ready to spend time with him? <laughs> oh Lord, as we look into this, oh Father, how easy it is, is easy it is for us in our busy, demanding lives to have so many things. Uh, thrust upon us so many things to do, decisions to make that we just cannot uh, seem to get our priorities straight. Well, Lord, when we realize that, may we just be reminded here that you are against lukewarmness. And Lord, we as human beings, we admit that sometimes in our lives we have allowed ourselves to be complacent and lukewarm. And oh God, we want to repent of that. We want to just ask forgiveness and to say, Lord, Come into our lives, not just right now, but every day of our lives. Lord, I pray that we will just be encouraged to carve out that time every day where we just sit with your word, just sit with you, and just dine with you spiritually. And let you speak to us through your word and through other Christian friends. That we'll just have those times of revival, as Ken has mentioned, in, in our church, and just those times just to let you flow through. 
So Lord, thank you for this time. And we just pray, God, help each one of us in our battle against complacency, in our battle against lukewarmness. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.